welcome to this short presentation on non-causal responses to the inefficacy argument. The presentation is based on a chapter of my thesis. The inefficacy argument has two premises. First, what I do doesn't make a difference for the occurrence of the outcome. And second, if what I do doesn't make a difference for the occurrence of the outcome, I have no outcome-related reasons to refrain from acting in this way. Therefore, the argument goes, I have no outcome-related reason to refrain from acting in this way. For example, since my going for a leisure drive with a fossil fuel-driven car does not make a difference for the occurrence of future climate change and its related harms, I have no climate change-related reason to refrain from going for, for such a drive. And since my buying this factory farm chicken doesn't make a difference for the occurrence of future suffering of any chicken, I have no future chickens related reason not to buy this factory farm chicken. There are also collective benefit cases. In these cases, some benefit will occur if enough people act in a certain way, even though no particular such act makes a difference for the occurrence of harm. Profits, drops of water provides an example. In this case, a large number of wounded men lie out in the desert suffering from intense thirst. We are an equally large number of altruists, each of whom has a pint of water. We could pour these pints into a water cart. This would be driven into the desert, and our water would be shared equally between all these many wounded men. By adding his pint, each of us would enable each wounded man to drink slightly more water, perhaps only an extra drop. Even to a very thirsty man, each of these extra drops would be a very small benefit. The effect on each man might even be imperceptible. Assume further that imperceptible differences cannot be differences in harm. It now follows that adding a pint of water to the cart makes no difference for the occurrence of harm. And the inefficacy argument now says that since pouring my pint to the cart makes no difference for the occurrence of harm, I have no alleviation of harm-related reason to pour my pint into the cart. At least it does so if we tweak it a little to better suit collective benefit cases. Many think that the inefficacy argument is mistaken. At least in some collective harm cases or in some collective benefit cases, they think that you do have an outcome-related reason to act in a certain way. They might, for instance, think that you do have a climate change related reason not to go for a drive with a fossil fuel driven car, that you have a future suffering of chickens related reason not to buy factory farm chicken, or that you have an alleviation of suffering related reason to pour your pint into the cart in drops of water. The problem is to explain where the inefficacy argument goes wrong. You could refute the inefficacy argument by refuting the first premise. That is, you could argue that my act does make a difference or risks making a difference. I won't have anything to say about this today. Instead, I will concentrate on the possibility of refuting the inefficacy argument by refuting the second premise. There are two basic ways of doing this. You might argue, to take climate change as an example, that you have a climate ch change related reason to refrain from going for a drive with a fossil fuel driven car, since such a drive is a cause, one of many causes, of climate change, even if such a drive does not make a difference for the climate. This is the causal response. Or, you might argue that you have such a reason even if such a drive is not a cause of climate change. This is the non-causal response. Let's first take a short look at the causal responses. The details of the causal response could be spelled out in different ways. Braham and Van Hees argue, for instance, that you might be morally responsible for climate change in virtue of going for a leisure drive since a leisure drive satisfy a nest condition of causation, and Ericsson argues that you have climate change related reasons not to leisure drive or go flying across the Atlantic, since doing so might cause climate change if we understand causation as David Lewis does in his earlier writings. 
or I might have an outcome-related reason to act in a certain way, since acting in this way increases the probability of some harmful outcome, or since it raises the security of this outcome. This is the kind of response I advocate in my thesis. Now, uh, let's turn to the non-causal response, which is the topic of the day. There are many variations of the non-causal response. Take climate change, for instance. You might agree with Gareth Callity that it would be unfair to go for leisure drive while others refrain from doing so. Or you might think that refraining from such a drive would be the virtuous thing to do, as Jameson and Sandler argue. Or you might think that there is an imperfect duty to refrain from leisure driving, that you should refrain from your leisure drive things. Going for such a drive would make you complicit in climate change related harm, or since doing so would make you part of the group that causes harm. Finally, you might think that you lack a climate change re related reason to refrain from going for a leisure drive, but that you instead have another kind of reason a reason to form or join a collective that aims to address climate change. Today I will argue that these non-causal responses fail to explain why you have a climate change related reason to refrain from going for a leisure drive unless we can show that a leisure drive is causally connected to climate change. That is, the non-causal responses fail unless we can give some causal response to the inefficacy argument. Much of what I say have been said before. Uh, you could see the contribution of what I do in this presentation as gathering and elaborating objections that others have made before. But with the twist that I suggest that these objections point toward a causal response to the inefficacy argument. I will not have time to discuss all these non-causal responses, but I hope that I will manage to talk about three of them. Namely, fairness, virtue ethics, and collectivization duties. First out is fairness. Fairness is often invoked in free riding cases. In free riding cases, the relevant agents are also those who benefit from the outcome. Take mass transit for an example. The existence of efficient and affordable buses is a common good. There is some group that benefits from this system. Still, anyone in this group might think in the following way. Why should I pay my bus fare if I can just sneak on? Three euros more or less surely won't make a difference to the future availability of, of affordable buses. The common answer is, you're only able to gain the benefits of there being efficient and affordable buses because others pay their bus fares. So to not pay your fare would be unfair. In general, when we benefit from some common good, it would be unfair if some but not others contributed to this common good. And this unfairness grounds a reason to contribute to the common good. Fairness might also be invoked in collective harm and benefit cases. Take drops of water for instance. Here we may assume that we, the altruists, have a collective obligation to alleviate the suffering of those suffering from thirst in the desert. And if others contribute their pints, it would be unfair of me not to contribute mine. Therefore, if others contribute their pints, I have a reason to contribute mine. This is essentially Kalitis' argument for why each have a reason to act in the relevant way in collective harm cases and collective benefit cases. We might ask what unfairness is more exactly. There are several types of unfairness discussed in the literature. Here I will focus on two such types. First, things might be unfair if others have to work harder if I don't do my part. For instance, if a car needs to be pushed up a hill and it requires six people to do so, while there are eight of us available, it would be unfair if only six pushed a car up the hill while you and me just sit and watch. The other six have to push harder if we don't push. As Glover and Parfit point out, this kind of unfairness is not relevant to collective harm and collective benefit cases. In such cases, my contribution does not make a difference to whether others have to contribute more. As Glover puts it concerning voting, it's not like other voters have to vote harder if I don't vote. 
and it's not like the other altruists in drops of water have to contribute more if I don't contribute my pint. So we can set this kind of unfairness aside in the discussion on collective harm. There is a second kind of unfairness also discussed in the literature. Some argue that I have a reason not to rely on others to bring about some outcome while accepting myself from contributing. I have a reason to pull my weight or to do my share. For instance, some people argue uh, I have a reason to vote for the right candidate since in doing so I pull my weight in bringing it about that this candidate wins. Or some would argue I have a reason to pour my pint in, into the cart in drops of water since in doing so I do my share in our collective obligation to alleviate suffering. Kalliti says this and Lyons would agree. In these cases the outcome is reached just the same whether I contribute or not and others do not have to work harder just because I don't contribute but it is still unfair of me not to pull my weight. This kind of unfairness does apply to collective harm and collective benefit cases. I have a reason to do my share since I would re rely on others to bring about the outcome while accepting myself from contributing if I don't. Glover is skeptic about this kind of injustice. He rejects it as morally irrelevant and calls it a dog in the manger situation where you deny me some benefit that you cannot have. It could also be called a leveling down sense of fairness. Others, like Kalati, would not agree that this kind of unfairness is morally irrelevant. I will set aside the issue of whether we could have a fairness related reason to level down here and concentrate on another issue. As Nevsky argues, there is a deeper issue lurking here. As she puts it, if acting in the relevant way won't make any difference, then it does not seem that it pulls any weight at all, end quote. At least this is the case if counterfactual difference making is all that matters for outcome related reasons. For instance, if pouring my pint into the cart in drops of water won't make any difference for the suffering of the men, then why would pouring my pint into the cart count as pulling my weight or as doing my share? It seems rather that pouring my pint into the cart is on a par with pouring it on the ground. I agree with Nevsky that the fairness response gets into trouble here, but I want to add that we might get out of this trouble if we can show that there is some relevant causal connection between pouring my pint into the cart and the alleviation of harm. For instance, that doing so raises the probability or security of the alleviation of harm. The ex existence of such a causal connection could explain why, why it would be unfair of me not to pull my weight in what we all should be doing. Facing the inefficacy problem, especially when it comes to environmental harms, some have argued that we should focus on virtuous character traits instead of the effects of specific acts. For instance, Sandler argues that one important reason for preferring virtue-oriented ethical theories over non-virtue-oriented ones is that they better can justify individual responsiveness to such problems. Moreover, Jameson argues that utilitarians should become virtue theorists when facing the problem of climate change, since utilitarians agree that you're morally required to act in such a way as to produce the best outcomes, and since, in this case, a focus on character traits will produce better outcomes than a focus on outcomes of particular actions, Utilitarians should agree that you're morally required to focus on the previous. Still, it's doubtful whether virtue ethics gives us the tools we need to avoid the inefficacy problem. One initial problem, pointed out by Kingston and Sinot Armstrong, is that virtue ethics are mainly about what kind of person you should be, not about what you should do. However, they also grant we might overcome this initial problem by using a bridging principle, such as Hearst House principle that an act is right if and only if it's what a virtuous agent would do in the circumstances. Even if we accept this principle, virtue ethics have trouble explaining the intuition that, that I have an outcome related reason to act in a certain way in collective harm cases. This might be especially obvious if we understand this principle as referring to what a fully virtuous agent, a phronimos, would do. 
Say that a fully uh, virtuous agent is someone who does the right things for the right reasons. He realizes the morally relevant considerations in any situation, weighs them properly and acts accordingly. If so, and if there truly are no climate change related reasons to refrain from leisure driving with a gas gasoline car, the fully virtuous agent would realize this. He would not see a climate change related reason to refrain from leisure driving because there is no such reason. He might still refrain from leisure driving, so refraining from leisure driving might still be the virtuous thing to do. But if he refrains from leisure driving, he does so for other reasons. In fact, it's quite reasonable to think that a fully virtuous agent would do something else than go leisure driving. He would probably visit a friend, finish an important paper, spend time in nature, contemplate life, or something like that, instead of seeking thrills in a gas guzzling car. But surely the fully virtuous agent does not refrain from leisure driving for reasons that do not exist. So in considering what the fully virtuous agent would do, we find that we have reasons not to go for a leisure drive, but we won't find that we have climate change related reasons to do so. Maybe we shouldn't take the bridging principle to refer to what fully virtuous agents would do. Maybe it refers to what an agent with virtuous character traits would do. Still, we face the same problem. If the inefficacy argument is correct, it's unclear why it would be virtuous to refrain from leisure driving. For illustration, consider the virtue of loving and respecting nature. People having such a virtue would be opposed to the destruction of the natural world. Now, if it really is true that going for a leisure drive with a fossil fuel car does not contribute to the destruction of the natural world, agents that are opposed to such destruction would not see a destruction of the natural world related reason to refrain from going for such a drive. Or if they do, they are mistaken. This point have been made before, for instance by Sinot Armstrong, Sandberg, Nevsky and others. Still, I want to add that there seems to be a natural solution here. If we can show that there is a morally relevant causal connection between a leisure drive and climate change, for instance, if such a drive causally contributes to climate change, then there seems to be no problem in saying that those who are opposed to the destruction of the natural world would have a reason to refrain from leisure driving. And it seems that a fully virtuous person would have a climate change related reason to refrain from leisure driving to go for such a drive causally contributes to climate change. Finally, I will briefly discuss collectivization duties. These are individual duties or individual strong reasons to join, form or transform a collective that can take collective action to remedy some problem. Maybe we could start a local environment action group to combat climate change or maybe we should cooperate with the other altruists in drops of water and decide upon a collective plan. Held, May, Isaacs and Collins makes proposal along these lines. Either that you have duties to collectivize or that you might be morally responsible for not collectivizing. Maybe such reasons could explain the reasons intuition. My main objection to this proposal is that it is irrelevant for the inefficacy problem it does not explain the intuition that I have an outcome-related reason to act in the relevant way in collective harm cases. Instead, it says that I have a reason to join, form or transform a collective. This is something else. I could, for instance, apply for membership in the Swedish Environment Protection Agency while going for a leisure drive. To talk about collectivization duties in this context is not solving the inefficacy problem. It is changing the subject. Still, you might think that intuitions are not that accurate and that collectivization duties might be what we've been after all along. For instance, facing the problem of climate change, maybe you don't have the precise intuition that you have a reason to refrain from driving with fossil fuel cars, but rather the more imprecise intuition that you have a reason to do something about climate change. Then, you might think that this more imprecise intuition might be explained by referring to collectivization duties. I do think that you might have climate change related reasons to join, form or transform some collective that can take collective action to remedy climate change. Still, I do not think that these reasons explain our initial intuition. 
Say that you for some reason cannot join, form or transform some such collective. Maybe you live in a country where participation in such collectives are forbidden and severely punished. Even so, it seems that you have a climate change rela related reason to do something about climate change, for instance to refrain from leisure driving with gas guzzling cars. Or take drops of water and say that you for some reason cannot communicate with the other altruists. Would this really take away the intuition that you have a reason to do something? Pour your pint into the cart, for instance. There is also another problem. The inefficacy problem will often arise at a higher level. For instance, the actions of my local environment action group might not make any difference for the occurrence of climate change and its related harms. If so, the question arises why I would have a climate change related reason to join this group. The same could be said about working to change governmental policy. Governmental policies in a small country like Sweden won't make any difference to the occurrence of future climate change and its related harms. So why should I have bother transforming this collective? Now this other problem could be avoided if we could show that my local environment action group or the Swedish government has climate change related reasons to act in some way to remedy climate change. There must be something the local environmental group or the Swedish government can do, for instance, lower the probability or security of climate change related harm. But remedying climate change in this way then turns out to be something causal. So this is saying that collectivization duties only work in these cases if we can show that there is some causal connection between the acts the collective can take and the outcome in question. Again, I do not mean to argue against the existence of collectivization duties. I just want to highlight that we cannot conclude that there are such duties in some collective harm cases unless we can show that there are other morally relevant causal connections besides counterfactual difference making. To sum up, the non-causal responses to the inefficacy argument only works if there is some morally relevant causal connection between acting in the relevant way and the outcome in collective harm cases, or at least this is likely the case. Thanks for listening.